All right, looks like we are there. So um, good morning. I am JP Walsh. I'm a professor in the Graduate School of Oceanography and director of the Coastal Resources Center. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this session on marine microplastic pollution. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Actually, before I do that, let me just make a couple comments and say we have a, a wonderful lineup of speakers uh, and we'll sort of, um, let's introduce them as they go, have them all do that. But um, before doing that, I just want to give a quick overview. Uh, we'll be talking about plastics and I'll have an introduction on that. Uh, we will, um, the, this, the speakers will generally have 15 minutes for speaking. Um, we're gonna let, kind of have, ask them to speak for 12 minutes and then have three minutes for questions. I think we may have um, one person that might not be able to join us. So we may fill that with some good conversation and questions. And without further ado, let me give an introduction. Can you guys all see that okay? Could someone, I actually can't see anything. So can someone- Looks great. Okay, thank you very much. So um, good morning. I am JP Walsh, as I said, and unfortunately my co-chair, uh, Cody Sharp, uh, is not able to make the event today because she has a, a more exciting engagement that's come up. But um, our session today is Marine Microplastics Impacts on Coastal Ecosystems and Human Health. I want to begin by thanking the organizers of the event today. Uh, this is a really exciting conference, not one that I've participated in the past, so it's a pleasure to be here, uh, part of, put on by the Rhode Island uh, IDEA Network of Biomedical Research Excellence. Uh, again, I want to thank my co-chair, of course, the excellent speakers that we have lined up today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of them and all the attendees for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here to talk about this important topic. So some of you may remember uh, the movie, The Graduate, and this is, uh, those of us that study plastics often reference this movie. Uh, this is a scene where Dustin Hoffman gets a little advice about the future, one word, plastics. And sure enough, plastics um, are a ubiquitous material in around the planet. Um, and plastics are wonderful for lots of things. They are very durable. They can be used in all sorts of ways uh, because of their sort of flexible composition and um, uh, you know, vibrant colors, all sorts of benefits that they provide. But one of the challenges of plastics, of course, is that they are, are persistent. And we now, unfortunately, are finding plastics pretty much everywhere. Um, and I'll talk just briefly on that. Um, this is a picture that I took of on the coastline just um, south of the city of Providence. Uh, and as you can see, this shoreline uh, has accumulated quite an amount of plastics. And that's just the big stuff that you're seeing. So, um, you know, this is clearly a, both Plastics have provided an opportunity, but um, as we're learning, a real challenge for our, our environment. Uh, and we do need to be thinking about solutions. But before getting into um, the broader conversation, let's review some basic science. One of the reasons why we, we care, of course, about plastics and their impacts is they can uh, have real impacts on the marine environment. Some of the most obvious examples are pictured here. These are from various sources. I apologize for not having all the references on here. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, we've all, some of you are, are probably not in the marine field, but you've all probably seen images like these uh, showing the sort of significant impact of plastics on megafauna. Um, and these are important. But they, of course, don't tell the whole story because plastics come in a range of sizes and they can have impacts on uh, across the, the, the food chain. And that is some of the bigger questions that I think we'll be talking a little bit about today. Um, plastics have really been found everywhere on our planet. Uh, 
along the coast of Antarctica and in the coastal waters there. Uh, in the lower left, you can see an image from an ROV in the deepest parts of the ocean, the Marianas Trench. Uh, and some URI scientists uh, were doing some ice coring in the Arctic in the Northwest Passage and uh, found the fibers in the ice cores. So these are just a handful of examples. Of course, many of you that um, are maybe enjoying the beach uh, this summer are, are seeing plastics along your favorite coastlines. So plastics enter the world's oceans in part because there's just a lot of plastic. Uh, shown here on the left is global primary plastic, plastic production. Of course, it has been increasing over time, um, but we're looking at uh, on the order of 200, over 200 or 300 million tons of plastic per year. Um, a good amount of that, about a third, is in uh, coastal areas. And uh, it's been estimated that about a third of that is mismanaged, uh, which is basically uh, plastic that isn't being um, disposed of or carefully um, controlled. And uh, as a result of that mismanagement, some of that ends up into our coastal waters uh, and then into uh, our open ocean system eventually. So, um, you know, the, the reality is that this graph, it's shown here as sort of a static, nice color bars, but the, the, the reality is that it's been increasing over time. And the problem, of course, is getting worse. Um, and solutions are, are, are hard to find. One of the topics where many people have become familiar with the plastic problem is was the discovery of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Captain Charlie Moore uh, was credited with discovering it in 1997. And here's a map. You can see the coast of the United States and Hawaii and this area. Essentially what the garbage patch is, is um, an area of high concentration of, of floating plastics. Um, and uh, what we have learned is that it's not just, of course, in the Pacific, which I was just showing you over this patch over here, um, but when we ha have now looked around the world, in all of the gyres, which are basically a, a large uh, physical oceanographic circulation pattern that we find in the um, northern and southern hemispheres of the major oceans, uh, you can see that we have garbage patches. Uh, and that's just because of how plastic, it's, it's low dense, it's got low density and uh, the, the wind patterns and Coriolis end up create these areas of, of accumulation in surface waters. One of the um, some, somewhat unfortunate realities though is when uh, this, this is an important study that was published in 2015, based on survey work that was done around the world and some modeling of the, the distribution of plastics, they only account, accounted for about 1% of the total plastic that had been put in over the last, I think, 50 years was what they were using as their, their estimate. And, and so based on this, I think uh, the community really recognized that about 99% is remaining in the, in the ocean system somewhere. Um, it's breaking down into increasingly smaller pieces and accumulating on the seabed or on our coasts. Um, and of course, in organisms, which I think we'll, we'll be hearing about. So um, that is sort of a big picture reality. Um, of course, the, the problem of plastics is that they persist. They do break down because of photo oxidation and they can fragment and biodegrade and ultimately deposit on the seafloor. Um, as they fragment, uh, we of course produce more and more numbers of particles. And shown here on the right is a graph of, of size on the x-axis and the abundance of plastic. This is from that same COSAR study. And what they're showing is the just the abundance, the sheer number of particles, of course. We see a lot more microplastic. Those are particles less than five millimeters. And we, we see an incredible abundance of these particles in the environment as uh, these larger macroplastics break down. So some challenges 
and topics that I think we'll hear about today. Um, the quantification of plastic is, is quite variable uh, and that may come up, something we can talk about. How are plastics propagating from land to sea? Still a lot of open questions about when and how it gets to where it goes. Um, where does it end up? What impacts does it have? How do we curve all these inputs and impacts? And um, the reality is we do need a lot more science on this topic. And, and I think that we'll be hearing about today. So um, one final slide, I did want to let people know that this fall, the University of Rhode Island is hosting a, an honors colloquium. It'll be both in person and virtual on Tuesday nights, 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, and there are three sort of broad topics. Plastics and marine pollution is one of the topics, as well as coast and crisis and the future of seafood. So I hope you'll consider joining us for this important event. All right, so I am going to stop sharing and invite our first speaker, Vice President of Research at the University of Rhode Island, Peter Snyder, will be talking about URI's first university-wide signature research effort. And I'll let him tell you about that. So thanks for being here, everyone. And thank you, JP. Uh, great to see everybody here. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, please let me know if that doesn't work. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity this morning uh, to welcome you all. And uh, uh, it's wonderful that URI is able to play uh, the role of host this time for such an important conference. Uh, I certainly wish everybody was here in Rhode Island together. Uh, it would have been nice, but I think um, so far this virtual format has been working brilliantly. So uh, welcome everybody and thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to spend just a few minutes um, uh, highlighting how a research university like URI has taken on uh, this incredibly complex and incredibly uh, vital problem for all of us uh, as a society and as a species, um, being just a, a moderately sized research university in the smallest state in the country. Um, but uh, to Dr. Walsh's point, we are identifying this topic as a major university research thrust. And it's the first time that the university has even attempted such a thing. Uh, so so it's, it, I think it's um, poignant that, that uh, it's the plastics, uh, the human contamination of our oceans, particularly uh, from uh, polymer-based plastics as our first major research thrust. And I think we've all learned some very important lessons. Actually, I'm speaking to the choir because we're all scientists. And we know that uh, particularly uh, over this past week from the UN climate report uh, that we are facing absolutely unbelievable challenges uh, for which um, science will play a, has to play a critical role in the solution. Uh, that's also been uh, pressed upon us as a public uh, over the past two years by the COVID pandemic. Um, so again, this is uh, the, the major thrust for what a res any research university aims to do uh, to, is to translate our advancement of knowledge to tackling critical problems that we as a society and as a planet face. And so the way we're looking to do that with a couple of key uh, domains of study and, and plastics being the first one uh, is to develop what we're calling a collab or a collaboratory to support this work. And the definition of a collab is uh, a cross college. We have eight colleges at University of Rhode Island ranging from arts and sciences to, and engineering to pharmacy to education, nursing, all, all of our colleges. We are looking for uh, research thrusts that really will tie in the uh, integrated activity across all of our colleges because the problems are so complex that they require a massive multidisciplinary uh, effort to make um, any dent, uh, let alone uh, encouraging partnerships and strategic alliances all over the world to, to uh, join a global effort. 
So our collabs are constellations of work that uh, each one will tackle a complex societal problem. They're intended to showcase our strengths. Uh, obviously, we want to choose topics such as plastics that, that already draw on talent and depth of experience that we have uh, that we can bring to bear uh, rather than creating de novo an entirely new area for which we don't have any depth. Uh, we need to reach across all academic disciplines. I'm sure everybody here is aware that uh, at any research university, most of the external grant awards are coming into the STEM sciences. And it's a challenge to involve our colleagues in social sciences, humanities, and the arts as much as we feel we should and would like to. And so part of the mission of the collab is to do just that. We believe that we can't be doing this in a vacuum and that part and parcel of our effort is to create platforms for collaboration uh, uh, globally uh, with other universities, NGOs, nonprofits, and corporations, and to communicate what we're doing effectively. Uh, as, as I'm sure you'll hear from other speakers this morning, we're facing a major challenge in educating our uh, populace about this problem. We um, have been making inroads over the past 15 years, and we're at risk of losing all of that progress uh, because of the events of the past uh, 20 months with the COVID pandemic. We um, believe, again, that we're a, a, a moderately sized institution in a small state, so we have to be able to convene and cultivate partnerships at a major massive level in order to, to really uh, integrate and, and provide added value. Um, and we want to have tangible outcomes. We feel it's important from citizen science efforts to educational efforts that have demonstrable impact to new policy development, proposed legislation, new technologies, whatever it is, we want measurable outcomes. So why ocean plastic as our first uh, topic for a collab? Well, we know, of course, that the ocean is the source of all life on Earth. Uh, we're dependent on it, and it provides food uh, for billions of people, and could be and has been the source of important new therapeutics uh, for uh, dreaded diseases that we face. And yet the problems we're facing now uh, are causing an unprecedented decline in our ocean's health and our ability to sustain life on this planet. And as you'll hear from another speaker this morning, at least one or two, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has now uh, accelerated uh, the damage that we've been seeing over the past 50, uh, 40 to 50 years. Um, it does help that the topic we're choosing is uh, topical at the moment. That certainly doesn't hurt. It's not the reason why we chose this topic, but I think we can all admit that uh, you, sometimes you do have to strike while the iron is hot, and this happens to be something that is very important in the news, as it should be, and so we intend to, to make use of that in driving up uh, public support. So we started this effort about two years ago, and it, we're, it, it, at, what I'm learning over time is for any university to mount an effort like this, it takes about three years. So we're in the third year of launching this uh, collab as an independent entity at the university. And we started about two years ago with a think tank meeting that I'll describe for a second because it seems to be a formula that worked in developing collabs. But this graphic is not meant for you to read. It's too dense. Uh, it's merely a heuristic to show you that we, as part of this think tank approach, realize just how complicated this problem is, how multivariate the issues are, and why University of Rhode Island needed to choose our battles wisely. We cannot possibly intervene and intercede in every node of this spider's web of a massive problem that we're facing. So part of our uh, this think tank meeting that we used to launch the collab two years ago, bringing our faculty together with about 30 guests from foreign governments, domestic uh, government agencies, NGOs, uh, other academic institutions and companies, uh, was to really flesh out the nature of the problem and where you or I can have a major impact. And so with launching this collab, which happens to align well with the mark of uh, our start for the UN Decade of Ocean Science, and 
uh, all, there are all sorts of other societal you know, movements towards uh, um, moving in this direction. Um, we uh, um, you know, really believe that we are poised to make a serious contribution given our, uh, our, our self-identification as a ocean university, ocean-focused university in the ocean state. Rhode Island is tiny. We have, uh, we're 35 miles wide by 65 miles long, but we have 400 miles of coastline. We're dependent on our blue economy. We have a very diverse landscape and we have deep knowledge about our region and our bay and the estuaries that feed it. We also have excellent political champions uh, in our federal delegation uh, backing this effort. And um, we, we know how to engage in public private partners efficiently. And we also have great partners already. The, uh, the Ocean Agency is now in residence on our Bay campus and they have been a key uh, partner in this effort. So what we've done over the past two years is moved from about 12 interested faculty uh, in an organizing committee to now over 50 faculty engaged in research across six of our eight colleges and the remaining two, I've got my eye on a couple uh, individuals to draw in. Uh, we are forming massive interdisciplinary teams uh, that, that really do cross uh, the colleges nicely in a, in a really a novel way. I think this is a new experience for a lot of people. And we've had some very significant new hires uh, uh, to our faculty. You're going to hear from Professor Suckling uh, this morning as, as one example of, of a talented uh, new uh, recruitment to the University of Rhode Island. And, and part of our interest in some of these hires uh, that we've been making strategically is driven by the fact that we now have this collab launching. And we are investing in um, uh, new initiatives such as our EPSCOR uh, new, uh, we're, we're submitting for our next track one award. Uh, because of this collab, uh, a, a decision was made about a year ago to focus that new uh, application on this topic, which, which probably wouldn't have happened if the university didn't start with uh, the collab concept. Um, so we, in, in going back to that spider's web of a graph that we, that came out of the think tank meeting, we distilled that down to five mission driven programs, not to say that we won't work in other areas related uh, to this, but we, again, we have to focus, uh, and, and, and I think that would be true for any collab at any university. So because of our rich history as a textile manufacturer and Rhode Island still has 70 textile manufacturers uh, in the state, although the, the industry has certainly um, uh, 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 decreased over the, uh, the past hundred years, we do have a very keen, keen interest in the uh, role that plastic microfibers play, uh, particularly from textile production and uh, treatment. Uh, and the rise of uh, um, uh, societal scary uh, events such as uh, uh, the fast fashion movement uh, on the proliferation of nanoplastics in our water. We are very interested as a major thrust in developing major tools and uh, also understanding how the plastics behave, behave in our water, travel, uh, what they carry on them, what adheres to the biofilms, uh, uh, on plastics that might transport um, invasive species and viruses uh, as uh, vectors. How do they enter our food? How do they enter tissues, both uh, animal and human? And what might be the health impacts that remain largely undiscovered? And then finally, involving uh, our social scientists, marine affairs specialists, uh, marine uh, legal experts and uh, political scientists, we need to be working on solutions, on educational solutions, as well as legislative solutions um, and technical. So those are our five uh, mission-driven programs. Part of the process in developing the COLA, excuse me, was to um, put together a formal position paper by the university where we kind of plant our flag in the ground and, and make a statement as to why this is critically important and why we need to be involved and focus on this as a research thrust. 
Again, this university has never done such a thing before. Uh, so this was quite a, a team effort, uh, probably involving over 60 uh, readers and edits and revisions. Um, that can be found, that position page, uh, paper, in our most recent issue of our research magazine. If anyone just Googles URI Momentum Magazine, you'll find it without a problem. And uh, that position paper is uh, there. And then the rest of the magazine for this issue uh, is taken up by what are we actually doing now with $8 million in funding over the past two years that have come in uh, to address those five thrust areas for the university. So that's how our university is kind of stepping up. Uh, we are actively seeking partners, um, both uh, nonprofit, corporate, and uh, governmental and university partners uh, around the world. Um, these are the people we're just beginning to talk to, uh, but, but there's many more on the list that will be added. We're very interested in engaging with any of you um, and forming relationships with your laboratories, with your research programs, and with your university leadership. Um, I can be contacted, very, I'm easy to find, uh, and, and I would encourage anyone to reach out with any uh, ideas, interest, or uh, potential joint uh, efforts that we might uh, take together. So thank you very much, Dr. Walsh, and that's what I got. Thank you so much, Peter. If you could stop sharing and uh, we'll, we do have a time for a quick question or two. Um, I just wanted to say how I really love the collab concept and I do really feel like it's, it's a nice example of how universities can lead and bring, you know, groups together that are not always connected. So really commend, commend you for, for uh, making this happen and I look forward to see what comes out from, you know, after years of effort. Any questions, quick questions? All right, well, we will stop there. We're just about at 9.30. So um, our next speaker, thank you very much, Peter. Our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Colleen Suckling, who will be presenting on determining whether microplastics impact marine organisms. Thanks, Colleen, take it away. Thanks, JP. Can you see my PowerPoint slide okay? Yes, we can. Looks great. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much for organizing this session. Uh, and it's um, uh, it's kind of difficult following Peter Snyder with these big, big kind of global initiatives and, and just strong plans for um, where your eye stands in terms of plastics and, and trying to solve a lot of the issues that we face with these. Uh, we're now going to kind of take a very small focus but an important one, which is kind of understanding how microplastics may be impacting marine organisms, because this is something we don't have very much information on because microplastic research is a relatively new area of science. Um, so just a quick intro, I am from the University of Rhode Island. I'm an assistant professor in sustainable aquaculture. Um, and I have started up, well, I'm a relatively new faculty. So my lab is now fully equipped as part of my startup to process microplastics um, all the way down to size uh, 10 micrometers. Oh, just a second, there we go. So I'm just gonna do a very brief introduction because I know JP gave a tremendous um, overview about uh, how plastics are ending up in our oceans, especially with microplastics. Um, but we do know that there is huge international effort to try and address this, in question, this question of how microplastics may be impacting marine communities and, and, and uh, individual organisms. We depend on them for many um, processes such as ecosystem services and seafood, so it's a really important uh, step to take, especially when we're considering how we need to best manage uh, waste um, going into our oceans around plastics. So just a reminder, microplastics, they are defined by their size range. So we are talking about these small synthetic or semi-synthetic particles, which range from five millimeters all the way down to one micrometer in size. And as JP highlighted, um, the major sources of plastics coming into our oceans is uh, from like domestic waste, industrial waste, wastewater treatment centers, just as a few examples of what's coming into our coastline. And through wide distribution across our oceans with our, um, the movement of our amazing oceans, uh, they are being distributed everywhere, sadly. 
Now, the eventual fate of most of those particles is to eventually sink to the seabed. And this is where I'm kind of taking a focus today with all of you um, in our wonderful audience today. So researchers who have been looking at trying to quantify what microplastics are existing in sediments around the globe have found anything from just a few all the way up to about 25,000 particles of plastics uh, within a kilogram of surface sediments. So it's extremely variable. We still need to kind of build up on this data because it's still very limited. And I imagine some of our speakers later on in the session will discuss more about some of the challenges behind trying to um, quantify plastics, which require very clean working environments, because our clothing, everyday clothing with synthetic fibers can be, act as a contamination disaster for do, conducting some of this work. Now, as an ecophysiologist, I'm really interested in understanding how the animals on the seabed, which we call benthic organisms, are going to be exposed and interacting with those microplastics building up there. And we still know very little about this because again, this is a relatively new area of science. Uh, studies have tended to focus on uh, species with strong economical importance. So uh, the oyster here, for example, has had a lot of focus as well as fish. Uh, and also a lot of our information that's available to us is quite limited and is, is showing a really devastating impacts of microplastics on animals. But the problem is they are skewed towards lab studies which have used extremely high concentrations of microplastics uh, which are several orders of magnitude greater than what we would actually find in the marine environment today. So, uh, so it has elicited these kind of horrible, um, awful, devastating responses. But there's a big mismatch in terms of what the environmental concentrations of microplastics uh, look like and how they're impacting animals. And, that's a, and that causes some, um, some struggles for a waste management perspective and an ecosystem management perspective as well. So my lab is basically addressing some of these information gaps by looking at um, other economical species and ecologically important species and trying to understand the um, impacts of plastics that we actually find in the natural environment now. So a, a species I'm going to focus on today with all of you is the sea urchin. So it's these globular spiny animals that live on the seabed. Um, these are incredibly important ecologically. They can dictate what lives in a given area because they're um, sort of heavy grazers are in that area. But they're also economically important. So some of you have probably tried sea urchin in a sushi restaurant or perhaps an Italian restaurant. Um, and some of you are probably thinking, how on earth would you possibly eat the sea urchin, which is fair enough. Uh, so inside the sea urchin, we have this um, five um, star shaped edible row. So this is the gonad tissue, but we call it uni in the market. Uh, and the larger this row and the brighter orange and brighter yellow colors fetch the best market prices. So it's something we can kind of measure in terms of impacts. And we can actually get this across New England. So if anyone's going out for lunch this weekend, I do try, do recommend that you go and uh, see if you can find it on the menu and try it out. So before I even talk about my research, I think it's um, important just to do a quick 101 on how, um, what, how the anatomy of the sea action looks and how that uh, will influence how they might be Im impacted by plastics or experiencing plastics. So on the underside of the animal, you'll see these um, five calcareous like teeth sticking out. Um, and on the side view, it says like upside down pyramid called their Aristotle's lantern. And what these effectively do is they all um, open up these five separate teeth, grab onto a food particle, break it apart, and then pull that particle into the um, digestive tract. And I'm really not sure if this is going to work. Oh, it is wonderful. So it's just a quick demonstration of how that looks. And this is the, and this is how the urchins will be grazing on the seabed um, and likely ingesting microplastics with their food particles. Another way that urchins can be experiencing plastics as well as through the top side of the animal. So on the other end, we have the uh, other end of the digestive tract, we have the anus here. And just next to it, we have this very large plate called the madreporate. So up close under a scanning electron microscope image here, you can see that this is a very porous plate and it has an important function. This draws seawater into the animal and then the animal will compress that water through a water vascular system, like a hydraulic system in a sense, and it will compress it so that it's able to mobilize its um, these kind of like watery soft tissue tube feet, which have these suckers at the end, like, like sea stars have. But it's an important function because it allows um, waste removal and also respiration functions as well. So I'm concerned because if this is drawing in seawater, this could potentially draw in microplastics or even get blocked by them in these pores and therefore affect the physiology of the animal. So this is something um, I will be looking at uh, in, in some detail in this talk. 
And sea urchins are pretty clean when you see them underwater, despite them um, having lots of organic material falling on them through the from the surrounding water. And it's because they've got these amazing, oh, excuse me, these amazing pen, appendages called pedicellariae, which are these microscopic jaws. So here's one up close, um, which my student took a photo of under the microscope. And these will actually physically remove particles off the animal. So we don't know if they actually even recognize microplastics or not, these, these anthropogenic particles. So this is something that we need to assess as well. Okay, so that's the basic 101 of urchins over with now. And I can talk to you a bit more about the case study that I want to go through. So the questions I'm asking are, um, do species respond to microplastics? And if they do, do they respond in the same way? Uh, and these are kind of the basic questions we still don't have major answers for in the field of microplastic research, unfortunately. Um, the case study here is looking at temperate East Atlantic species. So I have the, a European green sea urchin on the left-hand side here, and I have a European common sea urchin here. I'm just going to call that purple sea urchin for ease because it looks purple, um, just, and also because we are time constrained. Um, and both these species, they can function in the same way. They have the same pedicillary appendages on the surface of the body to be able to remove particles. Um, but their diet is slightly different, which is why I think it'll be interesting to compare these two species for um, ingesting microplastics. So the green sea urchin is something that we call strongly omnivorous. So this means it feeds on a range of animal matter and soft um, like algae. And with the animal matter, it, it, it can ingest these hard components of the diet. So they'll ingest small shells, small skeletons and pass them along the gut. So these are experienced in, in handling hard particles. So if they ingest plastics, they're probably going to be quite resilient to this. Um, but our purple sea urchin over on the right hand side here, although it is omnivorous, generally speaking, it has a much stronger preference for ingesting largely soft algae material. So it's much less experienced in handling these hard particles. So we think this animal is probably going to be a little bit more sensitive to ingesting and passing along these hard microplastic um, materials along the gut. And the plastic I'm using here is polyvinyl chloride, PVC, in the range of 50 to 60 micrometers, which is particles that we can find within sediments. So first of all, well, we did two trials. One was to look at how they uh, were able to cope with external exposure of these PVC particles. So how well were they able to uh, function when the water surrounding them was, was um, littered with these PVC particles. So I've done this in a kind of storm disturbance kind of context here. So we don't know much about storm disturbances where if, when a storm hits uh, the, the ocean, it can disturb the surface of the sediments, which contain these microplastics and suspend them back up into the water column, which will then cover the animal. So I was interested in using this context. So we know that um, earlier in the slide, I mentioned that there's about 20, it can be, we can find up to 25,000 particles of plastics within surface sediments. So I'm translating this to 25,000 um, particles of plastics per liter of water. Um, and we exposed them for 20, uh, sorry, 48 hours and looked at a whole range of things to see how they were coping. And the, to, to cut a long story short, they were very resilient. They coped very well. Uh, we saw no impact on their oxygen consumption as a good proxy for metabolic rate. And also um, the writing time, which is where we turn the animal upside down and then time how long it takes to correct its position. And this is a good proxy for how well that um, pressurized seawater system is working and mobilizing the animal. We saw no impact on that and no obstructions in the module port. So overall, these, these little grasping appendages, these pedicellariae are really functioning well, removing these particles and recognizing them. So this is a, this is a really promising thing to see. What about an, what, what happens though when an urchin starts ingesting microplastics from surface sediments? Well, to test this in the lab, um, I generated a formulated feed I've used in previous studies, um, which doesn't contain any plastics, and I added 0.5% mass of PVC uh, particles. And this is a concentration that we do find in surface sediments. So this is environmentally relevant concentration here. And we fed these animals for up to two months, which is a sensitive enough time frame to. Um, see if there's any kind of dietary influence on the animal. Overall, um, growth, they were fairly resilient. Growth, the, um, the, the gonad tissue and the color, which were influenced by diet, diet very heavily, these were not affected. Reproductive stage was not affected, which is great. But we did start seeing some differences when we looked at the gut mass. So what, here we have gut mass relative to the whole animal uh, mass expresses a percentage. And basically the gut, 
acts as a secondary site for nutritional storage. So if we see a reduction in gut index or alimentary index, this um, highlights that the animal is nutritionally compromised. So we see here the green sea urchin is resilient. We're not seeing any difference from when it's fed a diet with PVC or a control diet not containing PVC. But our purple urchin is much more sensitive uh, where we are seeing a reduction of this um, alimentary index after being fed PVCs. So we think that the plastics may be causing um, uh, physical damage along the gut, which the animal has to spend energy to repair potentially, but we're looking at this in more detail now. But overall, just, what does you know, this you're mean? Just, you're just into your time for questions. Okay, just okay I'm, I'll be finished in a second. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, the largely resilient responses are species specific, so it shows we can't generalize um, responses from a waste management or decision-making perspective, so we have to look at more and more species individually. But it also highlights that we need to um, clean, we need some strong cleaning protocols for seafood preparation because when we eat the uni of sea urchins, which is this tissue here, we have to cut through the gut. And that means we're exposing the edible uni to these plastics trapped in the gut. Uh, so we have to make sure we have strong cleaning protocols for that. But more interestingly, what we see here is an increasing sensitivity to microplastic ingestion when we go from um, a strong omnivory diet to a strong herbivorous diet. And this really is exciting because it shows potential for using dietary habit as a sensitivity indicator for some species. And so this is something that we're looking at because from a management perspective, this could provide an important tool for assessing impacts and making decisions. So last slide, um, we have funded projects which are looking at microplastics in Rhode Island coastal waters. Uh, and it's on a project called Ozimap Ocean State Initiative for Marine Plastics, which can be accessed on this website here. We'll be presenting our data, more information about the project and the team, and we're looking at microplastics as vectors for organic pollutants and disease across the food web of oysters and crabs. Uh, and I want to say thank you very much to everyone, the institutes who helped out, and more importantly, the funders, and especially the USDA. And thank you to the audience. Thank you so much, Colleen. That was excellent. Uh, got a quick time. I saw one question pop into the chat from Sharon Rounds. Are the microplastics found within sea urchin tissues? Was the question. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so microplastics are being found in the gut of the animals. So um, I know Chinese researchers have collected a bunch of like species of urchins from the ocean and found microplastics in the gut. Uh, but they, um, but I can't, they did find some plastics on the gonad tissue but it's not clear whether that was from contamination from the different, um, when processing the tissues. Um, so we, so in, in essence, yes, we are, but we don't have a huge amount of detail on that yet. If it's nanoplastics, which are even smaller than one micrometer, probably, but this is something we don't have capability to a size. Uh, it's not a size we can reach in our lab. And if there's any collaborators out there who can do it, we would love to talk to you. That last point's a really important one. Thanks, Colleen. That really Great presentation. Any other quick questions? We may have a few seconds. All right. Well, I'm sure there'll be more that pop up. Thanks so much, Thank Colleen. You. That was excellent. Um, our next presenter is uh, my student, uh, Victoria Fulfer, uh, who's a PhD student in the URI Graduate School of Oceanography. She will be presenting shore to seafloor plastic distributions throughout Narragansett Bay sediments. Yes, thanks JP. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, so yes, I will be talking about some preliminary results looking at the distributions of plastics throughout Narragansett Bay sediments. So as it has already been highlighted, um, plastic production has been steadily increasing since the 1950s. And with this increased plastic production, we're seeing an increase in plastic waste that is being mismanaged because while some of it is recycled or incinerated, almost 80% ends up being discarded. And a lot of that does end up being mismanaged waste with 8 million tons per year entering our ocean systems. And so once it enters the ocean systems, it's able to be broken down into smaller plastics called microplastics, which Colleen did a great job of um, introducing. And this happens through a range of um, effects, uh, everything from wave action and degradation while it moves along the seabed 
to UV degradation uh, when sunlight causes the plastics to become more brittle and break down into small particles. And once they are broken down into microplastics, this makes them more bioavailable or able to be ingested by organisms such as zooplankton and fish. And just speaking of that, um, I won't be talking about this research today, but last week we did publish um, a paper looking at how even the very smallest ocean predators, single cell microzooplankton are able to ingest microplastics and it does negatively impact their growth and grazing rates, which could have further implications for fisheries production and human health. So back to the work I will be focusing on today, um, we have a few research objectives, including quantifying and mapping the distribution of the plastics in our bay, uh, determining the sources and accumulation sites, and uh, looking at the different polymer types or types of plastics. So I'll be focusing on Narragansett Bay, which is here in Rhode Island. It's a very large estuary. And here you'll see a map of the population density. And uh, you'll see that we have very high population density in the watershed surrounding the bay, almost 2 million people. Um, and in addition to that, we tend to have about 12 million visitors a year coming to the bay for recreational activities. I'm sure if you've ever been to a beach in Rhode Island, you've seen a scene similar to the one here on the bottom right. It's very, very crowded. People are boating and fishing and um, using, uh, using the bay for all kinds of recreational activities. But this of course can increase the amount of plastics that are entering the bay. Um, which can be everything from runoff from roads, rivers, or stormwater, or direct littering onto the beaches, which then can enter the bay during high tide. This study involved eight sites ranging all the way up from Water Place Park, which is in, in the city of Providence, uh, south all the way to Narragansett Town Beach, which is just south of where I am now, and also including two sites on Aquidneck Island. And when we visit each of these sites, we uh, conduct a series of transects depending on the size of the beach. And on each transect, we are collecting um, uh, glass jars of sand or sediment. And we tend to collect four different types of um, samples at each site, uh, an upper sample right near the edge of the dune, a middle sample, a lower sample, which tends to be between the high tide line and the low tide line, and then a subaqueous sample where we'll go out into the water and collect um, a sediment sample from beneath the ocean. When we bring these back to the lab, we work in a laminar flow hood to try to avoid any type of contamination. And we will sieve the samples for different um, size classes. So we'll look at ma macroplastics or larger than five millimeters and at large microplastics, which we're defining as between one and five millimeters in size. And when we sieve these plastics, we're able to visually see them and pick them out of the uh, sample. But for our smaller size class, which we go all the way down to 125 microns in size, we use a dense solution of sodium iodide, about 1.8 grams per centimeter cubed. And this is more dense than most of the plastics. So the plastics will float to the top of that solution and we were able to then extract them, uh, filter them, and then look at them under the microscope in order to see with how many plastics we're getting in each sample. So just to look at a bird's eye view of what we have found so far, um, this is just looking qualitatively when we visit our sites, we look around to try to classify how polluted the site is just at a first look. And so what we found was that the sites up in uh, Providence and in the Providence River, there's plastic uh, pretty much everywhere that you are looking. And then as you move south through the bay, those sites tend to be less polluted. It's harder to find uh, large, micro, uh, large macroplastics. But looking at then the samples that we take and the microplastics that we find, we had a very similar trend where we had incredibly high concentrations of plastics up in the Providence River, but much lower ones down in Narragansett Beach. And so what this is telling us is that those plastics that are entering the bay are being widely spread as they flow through the bay system and could possibly be sinking out um, into the sediment and being stored there rather than floating down and being deposited in those southern sites. We, uh, because we had such a wide range of microplastic concentrations, I wanted to compare those to other studies. So each dot here is a different study. This figure uh, came from a paper by Peter Harris in 2020. And we're looking at similar environments such as estuaries and beaches as to our sites. And so our samples, um, 
uh, kind of fit the whole range that other studies have seen, everything from the very low end to the very high end. But even our most highly polluted sample here is not as polluted as the most uh, polluted site um, in this study. So that's good, even though it was quite polluted. And so I'm just going to quickly go through two case studies, um, the first being the Providence River shoreline. So this was a shoreline just south of Bold Point Park. And as you can see from these images, everywhere you looked, there were macroplastics. And you were also, when you looked down, able to see these small fragmented pieces. Um, and when we extracted from our samples, there was an incredibly high concentration of plastics at this site. Uh, because this had a very large number of plastics, we wanted to be able to uh, characterize the different types of polymers that we're finding. And to do this, we use two different methods. For our larger particles, greater than a millimeter that we can pick up with tweezers, we're able to use Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy or FTIR. And basically what this does is we, uh, we uh, insert our sample and an infrared light source hits our sample. Some of that is reflected and some of it is transmitted. And uh, then we use Raman on our smaller uh, size class, um, those really small microplastics that can only be seen under a microscope, which uses a very similar um, technique, except in this case, what you're looking at is how much is scattered from the sample. So FTIR is looking at what is absorbed and Raman is looking at what is scattered. And this gives us sort of an inverse when you look at the spectra that we obtain. So here are common spectra of three popular um, plastic types, polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene. And what you'll probably notice is that they have a very similar pattern with subtle differences. And so when we measure our samples, we're able to compare them against a comprehensive database of plastics and other materials to determine what our uh, samples are made out of. This is just showing the top six uh, most highly produced types of plastic in the world, everything from the polyethylene tetraphthalate that makes up your soda bottles to your grocery bags and your food wrap, um, straws, takeaway containers. And then I also included uh, ethylene vinyl acetate because while this isn't a top six uh, produced, it was something that was commonly found in our samples, which actually makes sense since it is what is um, used to make flip-flops, the hand grips of fishing poles and other common uh, marine uh, things that you might expect to be lost in the ocean. And so when we look at this Providence River shoreline, we have so far been able to analyze 72 particles. And what we found is that polypropylene and high density polyethylene, the purple and the gray here, are what we're most commonly finding at this site. Now that we know what the particle, what types of particles we have, we can look at the density of these particle types. And so some types of plastics are less dense, so they're going to float on top of the seawater, such as your polyethylene and others are more dense. And so you would expect them to sink out of the water column and be deposited on the seafloor. This was a shoreline site. And so we expect to have less dense plastics uh, washing up onto the shore. And that was exactly what we found. Out of the 72 that we have so far uh, been able to analyze, all of them are less dense than seawater. And so it makes sense that they would be deposited on the shorelines of the Providence River. So then if we look at a subaqueous site, which is Water Place Park up in uh, Providence, this site, uh, Water Place Park, the river that flows through it, was dredged. And what they found is they were dredging sediment out of this river was that the machinery kept being um, clogged by the trash and pollution that was in the river, which caused almost $400,000 of delays in this project. But luckily, we're, we were able to access these mounds of sediment that you see here, which are the dredged material and sample them to see what kind of plastics were in the uh, river at the time. What we find is that there's a much higher diversity of plastic types that were found at the bottom of this river. And when we look at the density of all of these plastic types, we're able to see that there is a split. Some of them are more dense than seawater, which makes sense. They were found at the bottom of a river, that density should sink to the bottom. But we also had these uh, blue and gray particles that were less dense than uh, the water. And so they would have been expected to be floating, but instead were found in the dredged material. 
So we have a few hypotheses for how this could have happened. They could have been biofouled, which would increase their density, or they could have aggregated with other particles and then sunk to the bottom of the river. But overall, <clears throat> we will need to do more work to answer all of these questions. But what we have found so far is that there are high accumulations of plastics in the Providence River shorelines and much lower as you go towards the mouth of the bay. And that we're finding low density plastics deposited on the shorelines and that polypropylene and high density polyethylene, which are low density plastics, are the most common polymer types found throughout all of our samples. So in the future, we will continue to do beach transect analyses and we will also analyze subaqueous sediment grab samples to see if the subaqueous sediment of the bay is a sink for plastics. And then also look at shoreline environments that are uh, conducive to plastic accumulation. And with that, I would just like to thank my advisor, JP, my wonderful uh, undergrad, Nicole, and everybody who made this project possible. And I'll take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Victoria. And we're just imagine you're hearing a, a very loud roar of applause. Um, so if you could stop sharing and maybe we'll quickly, any questions out there? We have a few minutes. You can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. David Rand, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, great talk. And I have a question that I guess was asked in the early, the previous talk. Um, this is wonderful analysis. I'm curious if there are efforts in uh, Rhode Island to examine the distribution of these particle or microplastic types in animals. I mean, uh, one of my favorite animals is barnacles, which we work on here in the Bay and in Maine, and they are filter feeders. So just uh, it would be really cool to work with you guys on assessing that as a filter feeder and the biological impact of this as well as the general environmental. So great talk. Thanks, and absolutely, there are definitely a lot of labs looking at various types of organisms, um, and I'm sure uh, we'd be interested in looking at barnacles as well. I haven't heard of anyone uh, particularly looking at that at URI. Cool. Uh, Colleen, you might want to jump in on that one. Do you do you know anyone on doing work on barnacles or? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to jump in on, on Victoria's uh, session there. Great talk, to Victoria. Um, no, I, I don't think anyone is looking at barnacles. I mean, we're certainly looking at oysters um, across Rhode Island waters, and we're looking at um, other invertebrates as well, including crabs and the pulse urchins. Um, but the principle is the same. Like, we have a method that's established for uh, removing soft tissue to isolate the plastics. I mean, uh, I mean for those who are not familiar with it, um, for, for doing that, you have to go through a whole um, organic, like a like a alkaline chemical soft tissue removal. We have to go through a density separation with strong salts, uh, all operating in clean working environments as well, so we don't accidentally contaminate our own samples. And we've got a fully automated fluorescing microscope to help um, identify these smaller plastics because barnacles, I imagine, I don't know, I can't remember from my from my uh, my undergraduate marine biology days, but the food particle sizes that barnacles must be consuming are going to be on the small size spectrum, I imagine. Um, do you know, David? Yeah, they would be small, certainly. I think they'd be in your microplastic range. But it would be just neat to compare different filter feeders because they'll have different pore size or particle size acquisition abilities. And um, there just be, might be some neat ways to use uh, biodiversity or just the different way that animals filter to uh, to assess the the impact and obviously this would barnacles are intertidal but some mussels and things are subtidal so the, this density issue would be very cool and there are predictive things that you could um, think about in terms of how to assess where the plastics are winding up excellent well thank you very much for the question david and we're just past 10 o'clock so i want to keep us moving i did see it um, a, another question come in the chat. Uh, if we have more time, we'll, we'll circ you know, circle back and get those answered. So without further delay, I wanted to introduce, ja thanks again, Victoria, excellent job. Um, I wanna, our next speaker is uh, Jason Jacks. And uh, Jason has been sort of a colleague that we've been working on the plastic land to see together. Um, we had a a joint project funded uh, both to do some science and communicate it. And so it's a pleasure to have Jason here. Jason is gonna be talking about 
the scientific storytelling for impact. So thanks for coming, Jason. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me go ahead and share this presentation and we will go from there. Give me just a moment here. All right, everybody can see the uh, see the screen here. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So what I would like to do is start off today just by talking a little bit about uh, kind of approaches for communicators to take uh, when it comes to communicating science and the kind of the catchphrase that we've come up with uh, for for this process is is impact psychon. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the projects that were underway uh, in the context of the microplastics research happening at URI. So. A little bit about me, uh, just briefly, I'm a, an assistant professor in the journalism program at the uh, Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, prior to coming to academia, I am a uh, you know, trained filmmaker, photographer, visual journalist, primarily working in the science and the environment. And so I brought all that kind of experience into the classroom and now am designing uh, undergraduate and this semester graduate courses for students to start to learn these skills. And the goal here really is to find uh, ways for them to engage in kind of real world uh, experiential projects. So before we get to those, though, I want to just take a step back and give us a, a quick kind of overview of the media ecosystem and the world that we currently live in. Uh, because it's it's critical to understand how this ecosystem is functioning, uh, the media ecosystem for us to design projects where we can hopefully have kind of a more direct relationship with audience, which I'll get to momentarily. So if you can picture for a moment the world that we used to live in, uh, I like to equate it to the 405 uh, in Los Angeles at about, you know, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. It looked like this, right? The world was filled with media makers and communicators, but they all stayed in their lanes. So you can imagine this as cable television, as public television, newspapers, magazines, radio, et cetera. You had certainly folks who would change lanes. Uh, you know, you would have a New Yorker uh, journalist, for example, on the radio, but for the most part, people stayed in their lanes. And what kind of happened was, you know, uh, the invention of the internet. So being a visual person, the way that I like to conceive of and kind of explain the media ecosystem now is that it looks like this, in which at no point uh, is there an entry or an exit or a single lane. This is everywhere all at once. So this is, you know, Twitter, which is kind of going 24 seven. This is streaming content. These are kind of fully uh, formed, uh, you know, scientific shows that are happening entirely on YouTube and nowhere else. Uh, this is kind of the explosion in podcasting that we've seen over the last couple of years. So when it comes to thinking about how to be effective as a storyteller, as a media maker, as a communicator, one really needs to consider uh, a couple of different factors because the world now is so fractured. I think that's the key word here. The media landscape is fractured, but it also doesn't have kind of clear boundaries. So a couple of characteristics of those, just to kind of be a little bit more specific. In our 405 example, uh, that media ecosystem was expert centric. It was top down. It was passive, meaning that we'd all sit back on the TV, uh, you know, on the couch and watch our local news or we would watch one of several stations. Uh, it was observational. There was a certain amount of extractiveness to it. It was highly text based and it was continuous. There was an A block, a B block, a C block. There is a uh, there was a structure to it. Now, what we find the media ecosystem that we find is much more user centric, and this is voice of the story. This is really a description of the ecosystem as it stands. This, for example, is social media. Twitter is user centric, so we have to consider that when we consider on how to engage in that space. So the, uh, that ecosystem is user centric, it's distributed, it is participatory in this way that is incredibly de uh, democratic, although the full version of this lecture includes the kind of shadow side of that, which we won't touch here, uh, but something to be considered certainly. It is interactive, it's collaborative, it is visual, and it is everywhere and nowhere at once. So as a communicator, this is a uh, this is a, a very odd ecosystem to be working in. It means you have to really consider 
several factors, including platform and which uh, the other version of this lecture that is a little bit longer, we won't have time to dive into very deeply today, but is this notion of audience and identifying audience, because that is a, a really is a critical step to understanding how to work in this space. So we're kind of left with this challenge as science communicators, as visual journalists, as storytellers. And that media challenge is trying to figure out the best tool because we have multiple tools at our fingertips now, especially because the cost and the, uh, the, the kind of specific challenges of working in each of those mediums have changed, they've become more simple. So we're trying, our challenge is to find the best tool to tell the story within that medium and how best to engage the audience. And again, this is where that kind of that interaction between the type of story you're telling, the tool and the audience all kind of come together. So it's a much more kind of challenging environment to work in for communicators, but I think for science communicators specifically, there are, you know, kind of, uh, there's an immense set of opportunities to find meaningful ways of engaging audiences. And again, that first step being figuring out who it is that you would like to speak to and where do they meet. And that's the kind of the headline for figuring out audience here. It's a kind of a, the critical piece of it, that critical first step. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes uh, diving specifically into the microplastics work here and kind of describing both the media approaches in the context that I, I kind of just described with our central challenges, but then also finding a way to bring in experiential education, both for undergraduates and for graduate students, uh, because finding opportunities for that collaboration between undergrads, grad students working in this space, working specifically in communications, uh, and then finding a way for them to collaborate on real world projects with researchers at the University of Rhode Island and, and ultimately uh, in other places as well, I think is, is a really meaningful way of, of moving forward. So let's begin by kind of understanding the, the question posed at, at uh, URI. So you've heard from Dr. Snyder, you've heard from several researchers who have taken pieces of this larger question and have dove really deeply into trying to answer those. So kind of the headline from a communicator's perspective, if you will, is that an interdisciplinary group of researchers here at the University of Rhode Island are trying to understand among other things, the distribution, concentration, and effects of microplastics pollution. If we understand that as the headline, then we can kind of move from that idea into our more specific audiences. And these are still, to be very clear, the audiences you see on the slide are still very, very broad, uh, but they help kind of narrow it down to figure out how we can engage uh, with different folks where they meet. So some of our audiences are students, our policymakers, our potentially local communities uh, with some of the, the kind of the mitigation work that's happened in Rhode Island considering bag bans, that, uh, et cetera. And then also industry. So how are, the, how are we going to develop those stories and what are the tools that we're going to use to develop those stories? Well, our goal for these projects have been to allow students to take agent, you know, to have agency, to take ownership, and to really kind of report out in the in the you know using the jargon to report out the stories that are being told, right? The stories that are happening at the University of Rhode Island, these research stories. So we've thought about uh, short video approaches, we've thought about images, we've thought about innovative approaches, and my collaborators, you've heard uh, from the, the scientific side, the research that they're doing, and now a little bit more on the, the kind of the media approach that we're taking that really is being student led. And I'm uh, kind of standing back and just ushering them in as it, as it were. So the kind of the primary way that we have communicated this work thus far has been through photography and text which might seem like, uh, you know, the, the 405 version of, of, um, of the media ecosystem, if you will. But we're finding, you know, text and image is still a really incredible, pow incredible and powerful way to communicate these stories. And so that's where we have begun, is creating compelling images, both for the, the cover of last year's University of Rhode Island Magazine. Dr. Schneider at the beginning moment, uh, mentioned Momentum Magazine, in which uh, a number of photographs are used in that throughout that entire magazine to help visualize this story. 
So we decided that this is a really effective way to at least begin these conversations using you know pretty traditional journalistic practices, print and uh, print and photography to really begin these conversations. So these have been produced both with myself and then in collaboration with my uh, undergraduate students to help get these images and to help kind of move these stories out into at first our very kind of local ecosystem right these are both university magazines they have a, a wide kind of local readership and now we're starting to think about how do we begin to engage audiences more broadly so one of the ways that we're doing that is uh, via video and so i've been teaching a capstone class in which students have been learning about uh, about the research that's happening at the university of rhode island i would thank my colleagues for spending their their time uh, over the last year coming in either virtually or, or back in the before times when we could come in person uh, and actually speaking to these students to help them understand what is at stake, the research that's happening, how that research is unfolding, the techniques, the uh, the methodologies, etc. And then actually having students go back to those same researchers and interview them, put together a, you know, kind of a, a media coverage plan and uh, and actually go out and produce video stories that uh, that engage with this topic. So you can see there's a QR code on the uh, bottom right of your screen here. This was a video that was both profiled in, this gets a little bit meta, but it was both profiled in Momentum, and then there's an actual video linked that was a, a work product, if you will, a science communication piece uh, produced by students in those classes. Jason, just so you know, just two minutes left, okay? Great, thank you so much. So we've got a, um, so two of those projects specifically that we're starting to innovate uh, a little bit in our approach here is with Dr. Walsh and uh, and our last presenter, Victoria Fulfer, we're working on uh, the capturing of that process in three dimensions with uh, 360 cameras to think about how we can tell that story about the kind of the migration of plastic from the, uh, from, the waste stream out into the wild, as it were, in uh, VR, basically in 360 video. We've come up with a way to do that, and we're going to be tackling that this semester as well. In addition, we're going to be uh, we're going we're working with Dr. Suckling and some of her co collaborators to produce a short video series for Rhode Island PBS and ultimately for uh, PBS Learning Media, which is a nationally syndicated about a million unique views a month educational platform. So finally, the way that this is kind of coming together here is uh, via an, a new laboratory that's being developed at the University of Rhode Island in the Harrington School, which I won't dive uh, too deeply into now, but the Science and Story Lab is, uh, is kind of a forthcoming framework and, uh, and a space for students and collaborators and communicators, both academics and professionals, to come together to early in the in the process kind of find ways, meaningful ways of collaboration uh, to take these stories, these ideas, and find audiences and deliverables so that we can have more impact with the science. We can actually bring the science out into the public media sphere, into this media ecosystem that I've described, find audiences where they live, where they're actually operating on those types of platforms and hopefully uh, make more of an impact with the communication. We have a whole framework for doing this, uh, which I would be glad to uh, take any questions about or engage uh, afterwards. The Science and Story Lab is kind of up and running, uh, will be up and running a little bit later this semester. So from a communicator's uh, perspective, thank you so much for allowing me the time to come in and, and uh, talk a little bit about the process and look forward to finding collaborative projects to bring science, you know, really directly and, uh, in the hands of the So thank you so much, appreciate it. Excellent, thank you so much, Jason. And I love the Escher analogy for uh, our our communication today. The um, really great, you know, I think uh, having you in here, you're sort of sandwiched between science, but that's um, an important sort of it's the, you know, the filling is always the best part. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but J Jason really is invaluable uh, at URI because he's helping us um, put our science sort of thinking about that, that story side and where we're going with it. And so I really 
appreciate his words. We're just, a, we're out of time. So I'm gonna pivot to the next speaker, but uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to ask Jason some questions. So our, our next speaker is Dr. John Cohen uh, from the University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy. He will be talking, uh, his title is uh, Microplastics Research in Delaware Bay, Observation Models and Ecological Risk Assessment. Take it away, John. Great, my slides are visible, I hope. Looks good. Great, um, great. well, thank you for the opportunity to, to join in today. Um, and it's really impressive to see all that's going on at URI. So we'll pivot a little bit um, south. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, my sort of co-conspirator, um, Tobias Kakulka, um, who is a URI alum, a physical oceanographer, and then a whole bunch of our students um, who've worked on this funding from NOAA through Sea Grant, NSF, um, State of Delaware, and the NOAA Marine Debris Program as well. And so um, jumping forward, we're here in Delaware Bay. Um, I hope my, can my pointer show? Do you see that? Great. So yeah. we're here in Delaware Bay, sort of blown out here. Um, it's an urbanized mid-Atlantic estuary. So we've got the city of Philadelphia, nice and large, um, Camden, New Jersey, Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and then down here, um, this is where I'm based down here at Cape Henlopen in Lewis, Delaware in the Southern part of the state. Um, but an urbanized mid-Atlantic estuary. Um, it has an interesting history of sort of full water column hypoxia in the upper reaches of the estuary that were really a result of untreated sewage coming from the large cities, um, which has been cleaned up since. So um, Cody Sharp, who couldn't be with us today, her father was actually hugely instrumental in understanding that process um, of low dissolved oxygen. But again, it's been a success story in terms of the overall health of the, uh, of the estuary. Um, Seasonal upwelling on the continental shelf leads to some interesting physical oceanography out at the mouth of the bay in a cold pool, um, as well as um, there's a, a sort of a prolonged residence time of particles in the bay, um, more so than you might expect um, for that small estuary. Um, and that's going to kind of come back as we think about how long plastics might might be retained in the system, depending on where you are in the estuary. But this is something that we're that we're paying attention to. Um, but this is our estuary system that we're focusing on. And so the overall um, sort of shape of the, the work that um, Tobias Kakulka and I have put together has been really thinking about an ecological risk assessment framework as we think about microplastics and organism interactions. I'm not gonna focus on the, the, his, the background of microplastics, that's done, been done beautifully um, throughout, throughout this morning, um, but I will just focus on this ecological risk assessment framework where we're interested in risk to organisms. And so we need to think about microplastic exposure, um, so this MP exposure, which we'll just call E, um, and then the adverse response to an organism um, at a given exposure level, and so let's just call that A. And so risk is some product of E and A. Um, and so when we understand microplastic exposure, the way we're, we're trying to do that is through modeling, um, through um, a regional oceanographic modeling system, ROMS model, um, as well as observations of organisms and microplastics. And so we, if we can understand the hydrodynamics through hydrodynamic modeling, numerical modeling, and understand the distribution of organisms, um, also through that modeling as well as observations, then understand the microplastics through the modeling and the observations, um, we can get at a sense of time integrated exposure that organisms would experience. And then if we can understand through laboratory experiments, the adverse response piece, um, so um, survival, growth, other um, sublethal parameters, um, that ultimately would get us to a population level sense of the organisms, not just the individual organism response, but ultimately build that up to the population. Then we feel like we can get a sense of risk that micro microplastics might pose, and then maybe even try to relate that risk to environmental variability in population dynamics. And that's ultimately where we want to go. As you can see um, throughout the end of the talk, I'm not going to get there, um, but this is where we want to go. Um, so I'm not going to get your hopes too high, but I'm going to going to lay the groundwork. So um, three pieces to this, of course, I've sort of already alluded to them. The first is the distribution of microplastics. And um, in this case, we'll talk about pelagic organisms, zooplankton um, in Delaware Bay through field observations and numerical simulations. Um, and then the second part is using an example. This is um, a copepod, a carshatansa, very common in, in Narragansett Bay and in Delaware Bay as well. Um, so this is like, uh, for folks that are not marine inclined, think about sort of the ants of the sea. So these little little uh, crustaceans, um, um, in this case, uh, a carshatansa is very common sort of um, 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 organism that's gonna be food for fish and also grazing phytoplankton. And we've looked at acute exposures on these guys, 
particularly looking at mortality, and we've done culture studies looking at growth and metabolism. I'm just going to highlight some results there uh, today. And then I want to try to put it together a little bit for you in terms of risk from exposure and adverse responses. And, and this is going to be through um, some observational experimental work with simulated copepods, particularly um, looking at what might happen if you have copepods experiencing plastic in various ways. And so if we look at this first part, which has been a major focus of our work. So this is um, some data from a paper um, that came out a few years ago now, looking at microplastic concentrations in um, in surface samples in Delaware Bay. Um, so that's here on the left. The bubble size represents the concentration of, of plastics um, that we're seeing at a given location in these surface samples. I'm happy to talk um, offline about processing methods um, back then and what we're doing now. Um, you can also see, see the paper as well. Um, and so with Delaware Bay, um, we see the highest concentrations of plastic in this region of the estuary which corresponds to the estuarine turbidity maximum. And so I'm gonna talk about that in a minute and what that means and sort of what that, how that relates to things. Um, we see sort of lower concentrations here in the main portion of the bay, but again, higher concentrations here on the Delaware coast. Um, this is Delaware and then this is New Jersey up here. Uh, and then also some higher concentrations at the mouth. So it's not just kind of as Victoria was mentioning, in our case, it's not a high concentration um, at, in the Delaware River becoming diluted as you move down in the bay, um, we see some more complex dynamics and that I wanna talk about. We've also done a lot of sampling in um, rivers and this area of the Delaware Inland Bay. And so I'm just showing you in this sort of cartoonish bubble plot um, that we've got um, the lower Delaware River into the upper Delaware Bay, which is the estuarine turbidity maximum. We get concentrations of about three pieces per cubic meter. If you go into the rivers, um, that feed into the bay, again, that are feeding this bubble here. Those are about 4.5 pieces per cubic meter. Um, the Delaware Inland Bays, um, again, about three pieces per cubic meter. And then the main portion of the lower Delaware Bay, about 0.7 pieces per cubic meter. So again, we kind of are seeing, I guess, in some ways, that same pattern that was already discussed about high concentrations in the inputs and then um, let lower concentrations in the main portion of the bay. But there are some dynamics I want to discuss. When we apply um, FTIR, to those samples, um, that paper that I have up there used um, just um, FTIR, ATR. Um, we now move to a micro FTIR approach um, with a micro ATR or using it in, in reflections or absorbance mode. Um, we see in Delaware Bay, we see a fair amount of fragments, particularly in this, um, this ester and turbidity maximum zone and secondarily fibers, polyethylene, polypropylene, again, similar to what's been discussed. If we look in the rivers in particular, we see far more fibers than fragments and we see the emergence of polyester um, and particularly rayon, which would be an interesting thing to talk about, I guess, in this group, um, maybe later on or offline about how to deal with these sort of semi-synthetics or the regenerated cellulose type, type material. So let me move on. And I really wanna focus on that ETM um, in a little bit more detail. And so the ETM or the estuarine turbidity maximum is a feature of the circulation of estuaries where you have fresh water that's less dense coming into the system and saltier water from the ocean that's coming in from the system in the other way. And they're gonna layer on top of each other. And the colors here are salinity. So the blue is low salinity and the red is high salinity. And so um, what we're seeing is a series of stations sampled at three vertical depths. Um, just below the surface, midwater column, and then just off the bottom. So that's what these lines are here. And the bubbles represent the size of the pieces of, or the, the, con the concentration, the, the concentrations of plastic, as I've shown before. And um, when we look at this estuarine turbidity maximum zone, what we think is happening is it's basically a trap in the system. So it's trapping microplastics. And so if we just look at this squared off box and just look at these three stations, um, that's shown here on the right. So we see a change in the relative proportions of, of microplastics in these different type groups, uh, fragments, filaments, which you can think of as fibers and beads. And so are filaments or fibers trapped at depth is a question that, that we've come up with based on these data, because what we see is we see a lot of fragments at the surface, um, a, little bit, a little bit less so at depth. We see a lot of filaments at the surface, um, and then um, a little bit, uh, we only see beads really very deep. And so um, this again is just for um, um, one small subset of samples, but those patterns sort of carry on um, a bit more. If we look at more samples um, from, from, that, from those stations, what we see, um, if we break things out by polymer type, 
And so again, this is, has been described before and also relation to density. And so the density of the material is shown here as the order of the polymer type with lower density to higher density. Um, and we break that out by fragments, filaments, or fibers and beads. Um, a question that's, is, that we're trying to piece together is, are we seeing denser particles deeper? Um, and so if, I'm not going to show an analysis of all the stations, but that does seem to be happening. Um, particularly as we look sort of look in the filament or fiber section in the middle and then look at the rayon, that proportion of the of the pieces is increasing with depth, um, as we would expect. Um, and the um, uh, that's actually I think the biggest one I wanted to talk about there. But basically, um, we're we're wondering um, if we're seeing that density relationship. And we do think that um, we do think that that's happening when you look at the at the broader scale. I want to keep moving and talk about um, particles and the hydrodynamic model. And so I'm going to let this run through and then pause it right at the beginning. So whoops, there we go. Um, so um, the hydrodynamic modeling that um, that we've been doing has basically taken um, neutrally buoyant particles and uh, excuse me, well, we've done neutrally buoyant and positively buoyant particles. This simulation is for positively buoyant particles. And we've spread them across the bay in the computer model. And then we've let the model spin up and let them be distributed in the bay. And that's what's being shown on the right are the concentrations of particles at any given time. And so if we let that happen, we see that the particles aggregate themselves into tide lines, um, these hot spot areas where we can have up to a thousand times higher concentration change over the course of 30 minutes. And so what we're seeing when we look at this distribution of particles is really um, not a uniform distribution at all, but rather highly influenced by the estuarine circulation. And we're trying to get at that using GPS drifter studies to understand the mechanisms a little bit more. So these are GPS tag Lagrangian drifters. Um, we've just done a deployment last week where we set them out and they, uh, turns out they actually align themselves very nicely in the tide lines. And so we're excited about that. We've also done a series of experiments where we take bamboo plates and we put them out. And here you can see the plates have already been released and they're actually aggregated in those tide lines, just like we think the plastic should be. And you can see we're backing the boat up um, onto the, onto the, to pick up the plates that have aggregated in the tide lines. We follow those using drones over top of the boat to understand the movement of the plates, again, to sort of back up the, uh, the physical oceanography. I think I'm probably running out of time here, but um, the, I wanna get to the point, um, the second point about the biological effects. And so briefly with Akarsha, this copepod, um, we've done a variety of experiments. I'm just showing um, a subset here where we've looked at, um, at various plastic types. These are done with beads, um, biofilmed or non-biofilmed. We're moving to our own produced microfibers and microfragments, which I'm happy to talk to folks about offline as well. Um, the take home here is that we don't see any survivorship differences among our treatments, maybe a slight one at very high concentrations, but still um, survivorship doesn't seem to be impacted by bead exposure. Um, we saw these animals um, get larger as they molt from one stage to another, so they're very sort of stepped um, growth. Um, we saw an, a significant effect on growth at the earliest, um, the first developmental stage, that first step in growth, but that went away over on in our cultures. And so really with Akarsha, Akarsha Tansa, we see very minimal um, adverse response effects, um, which is consistent with some of what Colleen was, was, uh, was showing as well. And then I wanna just end um, with shifting into how we're trying to piece all this together with Akarsha. So life cycles of Akarsha are a few weeks. We can simulate that in the model by placing Akarsha in the model and then applying a field of plastic that we can generate by relating the microplastics and our observations to salinity. And that gives us our, our microplastic uh, particle field um, and then play these, play these animals out and so basically the little dots here now don't represent plastic, but they represent animals being moved around in the uh, environment, encountering plastic along the way. And so when we synthesize that all together, we can follow the trails of the individual particles that are the copepods and, and calculate what their exposures were. And so what you can see is we have fairly high, this is a microplastic concentration near the copepod as a function of time. So exposure level is fairly consistent. It jumps up and down, and then it, it, uh, it drops as you get outside the estuary. A little complicated, and I probably don't have time to go into it, um, but um, 
what we see is we see a difference with neutrally buoyant and with surface trap particles. And so depending on if it's a neutrally buoyant plastic or a surface trap plastic, the upper estuary um, is gonna have um, higher exposure um, in, in terms of the copepods than a lower estuary exposure if they're neutrally buoyant. If they're surface trapped, they get caught in those tide lines and actually the lower estuary where they're caught and retained in tide lines leads to higher exposure. And vertical migration, which is a biological feature of the organisms can remove those animals from that exposure. That's all what's coming out of the models. So um, just the, to wrap it up, I guess, um, we see about 0.1 to 5 plastic pieces per cubic meter in Delaware Bay, um, but we have hot spots that are, that are 100 to 1,000 times higher than that uh, based, on the, based on the models um, and some of our other sampling that we're doing. Um, females of Akarsha tansa and the growth of Akarsha tansa um, prior to that are not really affected by microbead exposure maybe earlier life histories um, looked at in different ways. And we're also looking at, at crab larvae, blue crabs, as well as other mud crab species. And we are seeing effects there that we're not seeing in, in the case of Akarsha. Um, and then I think just to, to wrap it up, I think the promising, what we're, what we're doing, we feel like has some promise in terms of how to synthesize these observations and models and exposure, because I think we need to move beyond just exposures of individuals and try to understand how those effects are manifested at the population level. And that is it. Excellent, John, thanks so much for, and you covered a lot. I gave you a couple minutes extra because we started you a little late. Um, really nice oceanographic talk where you covered everything from biology and physics and some sediment process transport. Um, I think we could give a quick question. Anyone have a quick question? If you want to stop sharing, John, maybe I could. You got it. Um, I know I, I had one, which was about your model and if it included, do you have wave, how is the wind surface treated? Do you have uh, wave processes or is it only a circulation model? Um, so there are wind and wave processes and they matter. Um, and so Tobias um, has sort of a sub, a sub model for, for um, wave processes and then the wind is prescribed and we've done um, different model runs. The, the biggest um, effect of the, the wind in particular is when it forces the plastic towards the Delaware coast, then it gets advected from the system more readily. And so um, wind direction does matter and it affects the particle residents as does um, spring versus neap tides. And so um, that's, that's a more complex story um, that's a little counterintuitive um, where neap tides actually end up with more advection, um, but it's, um, but they matter, the wind in particular. Excellent, thank you, thank you so much. And, and highlighting the physical oceanography was really nice there. So our next presenter is uh, John Weinstein from the Citadel. And he will be giving a presentation titled Microplastic Pollution Along the South Carolina Coast Linking Sources, Pathways, and Human Dietary Seafood Exposure. Thank you, John. Take it away. Yeah, thank you, JP. And thank you for including me in today's session. Um, the title of my talk really reflects um, our, the framework by which we've been studying uh, microplastics along the South Carolina coast. We've been trying to identify the sources of the microplastics and then understand the pathways by which they get into our coastal waters. And then ultimately, we want to say something about human dietary seafood exposure. Our approach to the global problem of plastic and microplastic pollution has been to conduct a series of backyard studies examining the scope of the problem in Charleston Harbor, which literally at the Citadel, that is our backyard. We are right on the Ashley River, which um, forms part of Charleston Harbor. And so this very much, this research has been led by students. It's been student led and student initiated. And over the last seven years, we've conducted several studies looking at the sources, fate and abundance of microplastics, the degradation of plastics, pathways for microplastic entry into our coastal waters. And then again, ultimately we wanna link this to human dietary exposures. We've already heard much about the fate of microplastics in um, coastal waters. Um, as Victoria mentioned and John just mentioned, density of the particles really does matter. Some of the less dense particles are gonna be in the surface waters. The more dense particles are gonna be down in the sediments. And um, 
the, um, the density is dynamic in that a less dense particle can grow biofilm and then becomes more dense and sinks to the bottom sediment. So most of the organisms found in estuarine environments are going to be exposed to these particles. And then, you know, from my toxicology standpoint, um, microplastics are fundamentally no different than any other pollutant in that there's basically two sources, two pathways by which they can get into our coastal waters. There are point sources, which are identifiable discrete sources, like um, piped industrial effluent or municipal wastewater, or there are the non-point sources, which there are no discrete points of entry. And you see some plastic debris laying in some salt marsh rack, and presumably these would be degrading into microplastics over time. So I wanna start off with our very first survey back in 2014 of Charleston Harbor. And just for orientation, this is the Atlantic Ocean out here. This is Charleston Harbor right here. This is downtown Charleston. And there are three rivers here. There's the Ashley River, the Cooper River, and the Wando River. And in this initial survey, we had five sites. And um, we looked both in the surface waters and in the sediments, but I'm just gonna focus on what we found in the sediments for the interest of time. We found a harbor-wide average of 23 microplastic particles per kilogram. And you can see there was a wide variation from one site to another in terms of the amount of microplastics we were finding. The highest levels we found were at Daniel Island, where we found upwards of 70 particles per kilogram. We also wanted to say something about their sources, and shape can be informative as to what the sources were. And I want to note that many studies have uh, found fibers being the predominant type of uh, microplastic particle shape. Uh, in this particular study in Charleston Harbor sediments, we found fragments to be the most common particle type. But it wasn't just any old fragment. They're very specific. They were oblong, they were black, and many of them were twisted. And this if you look in the literature, you don't find many studies reporting these black particles, black fragments um, as part of their findings. And I also wanna point out that we found these black fragments at all of our sites and at Daniel Island where we found the highest levels of microplastic particles, 90.1% of the particles were these black fragments. So we had a bit of a mystery. What are these black fragments? Where are they coming from? And so we as a lab group started brainstorming on things that are common and things that are black and things that are made up of plastic polymers around the harbor to try to identify the sources. And we started studying silt fencing, which is very common around Charleston Harbor, it's used for development. We looked at, um, this is geotextile fabric right here, riprap, it's used for erosion control. We looked at nylon fish netting, and we looked at even, um, the polypropylene uh, bags that are used for oyster restoration pro projects. And we studied how these break down in the marsh. And although all of these products do produce microplastics over time, they weren't producing those um, very distinctive oblong black particles that we were interested in. We started thinking about, well, maybe there's an industrial source to these black particles. And so we did a river survey of the Ashley River, the Cooper River, and the Wanda River. And the Cooper River is industrialized. There are seven industries along the river, three of which are involved in the manufacturing of plastics. And so what we found in this river survey was that although black fragments were found in all of the rivers, the Ashley River, which is a ur urbanized, suburbanized estuary, versus the Cooper River, which is industrialized, had the highest levels. So again, we were left scratching our heads. All along, we had been doing FTIR analysis and we were not successful initially with the FTIR analysis getting any sort of positive reading, but about on the 50th particle we had tried, and this is a couple of years into this project, we got a hit for polybutadiene. And we also came to understand that a lot of the patterns we were seeing were actually interference patterns caused by carbon black. Now polybutadiene and carbon black are found in tires. So we started looking in the literature and microscopic tire particles, and there are not a whole lot of papers out there, but 
in those few papers that are out there, we found very similar morphologies between the particles we were seeing under light microscopy and these microscopic particles that were being looked at using scanning electron microscopy. The Summer et al. 2010 figure, I want to point out, this is a microscopic tar particle, and you can see it's coated with silicates. So these particles are stealthy in that they are coated with other materials, which makes them hard to identify. And once we started thinking that these were tire wear particles, um, we started making predictions um, that we could find hotspots for these particles associated with road and bridge runoff. So the largest bridge crossing Charleston Harbor, Harbor is the Ravenel Bridge. And we went to either side of the Ravenel Bridge where the drainage lets out into these swells and we sampled the sediments. And sure enough, on the Mount Pleasant side of the bridge, we found 4.2 million of these particles per square meter. And on the Charleston side, 13.7 million. So using these three lines of evidence, we concluded that these mysterious black particles we are finding with microplastics are indeed microscopic tire particles. And we've also begun to ask the question, are tire particles an emerging concern? About 30% of the tire tread on your typical tire wears off during the lifetime of that tire. That means in the US, about 1.8 million metric tons of these microscopic tire particles are released. It's been estimated in coastal areas that 50% of them may end up in our waterways. And tire particles, um, their composition is a little bit different than plastics in that they contain high levels of zinc and hydrocarbons. So their toxicological properties uh, presumably would be different, but also they can contain preservatives like 6-PPD quinone, which has been attributed to coho salmon die-offs in the Pacific Northwest related to rain runoff and stormwater. So we've been putting a lot of our focus on these tireware particles. And so based on the sediment study, this is the composition of micro microplastic debris within the harbor, 57% of tire particles. We have 19% of fragments of foam, 4% fibers, and microbeads represent 1%. And so when we started thinking about sources, so where are these coming from? This is where we ended up. The tire abrasion represents you know, a large fraction of the micro, microplastic particles, their sources. But plastic litter, it also is a major source of the microplastics. And I know there's been a lot of focus on wastewater treatment plant and laundry uh, fibers coming from laundry. One of my colleagues at the College of Charleston, Barbara Beckingham, has done a study of the three um, wastewater municipal treatment plants in Charleston Harbor and found that there's very high efficiency rate of removal from the influent to the effluent, uh, upwards of 90%. And even though you know, a billion fibers are entering Charleston Harbor every day through the uh, municipal effluent, that this probably represents about a tenth of a percent of the total microplastics in the harbor. So our focus since has been on tire particles and plastic litter. Um, Back in 2013, we teamed up with South Carolina Sea Grant on their annual beach sweep survey where volunteers go out and clean up the trash um, all over the South Carolina coast. We teamed up with the site captains in Charleston Harbor and we had members of my lab categorizing and weighing all of the plastic debris coming out that was collected that day. And based on that effort, we estimate there are seven and a half tons of plastic litter on the shoreline of Charleston Harbor. Of that plastic litter, most of it is single-use plastics. We've also had several studies looking at how plastic materials, especially single-use plastics, degrade within the harbor. And we know in salt marsh habitats, the degradation begins very rapidly. And with fact, we see microplastics being formed in as little as four weeks. And so, you know, we don't estimate, but there are estimates out there that in, in the ocean, it takes plastics decades to centuries to break down. In salt marsh habitats, we estimate it's a couple of years to break down. And we see that breakdown process beginning in as little as four weeks. Um, 
So one of the implications is most of the plastic litter in Charleston Harbor is already producing microplastic particles, even though they might not appear degraded. And we also estimate that one nine inch foam plate, a styrofoam plate would produce 46,354 particles as it broke down over time. We've also very been, we, we have also been very interested in pathways, identifying the pathways by which the microplastics and tie particles get into the harbor. We've had a lot of focus, research focus on stormwater infrastructure and in particular stormwater ponds. And these are some results from one of my graduate students um, looking at one, four. One minute left, John, just you know. Okay, thank you. Um, looking at four, um, ponds, uh, two of them are residential, two of them are commercial and a reference pond. And you can see in the sediments, very high levels, upwards of 3,000 particles per kilogram. Stormwater ponds are designed to capture particles. And so these ponds are doing a good job at capturing tyre particles and capturing microplastic particles. Um, but we also find them at the discharge point and they're also in the tidal creeks. And this red line here represents the harbor-wide average of 23 particles per kilogram. So what we've concluded from this study is that even though stormwater ponds are probably serving as a sink and capturing the particles, that they are also under certain circumstances like heavy rainfall probably acting as a source as well. Bonnie Ortel, who um, is another graduate student in my lab, you'll be hearing from her next, has been looking at nuisance flooding um, nuisance flooding is interesting because it bypasses all the stormwater infrastructure and a direct connection between the tidal creeks and the, the street themselves. And she, um, this is a graph she's put together. Um, you can see mean sea level rise in Charleston. It's going up, but the number of nuisance flood events, these are sunny day flood events, has also increased. Um, she, she has found lots of microplastics and tire wear particles in the floodwaters, but there's also a lot of variability from one site to another site, and either, even, even from one sampling uh, day to another sampling day. Um, and you know, one of our hypotheses has been, well, this, the flood water picks up these particles and takes them back into the receiving waters. And that's not the case. We do not see a difference in the amount of microplastics in the surface water, you know, either before and after these flood events in the receiving water. So she's currently investigating, well, as that flood water ebbs, are these materials redeposited back on the roadway surface or are they captured by the fringing salt marsh? And Finally, we've been uh, interested in making those connections between the microplastics in our coastal waters and human health. So we've been doing a survey of microplastics and oysters from the recreational and commercial shellfish beds. Um, Cox et al. in 2019 estimated that annual human ingestion rate is between 39,000 and 52,000 microplastic particles per year which would mean that the average microplastic meal has anywhere between 35 and 47 microplastics. What we find a dozen oysters from South Carolina would have 238 microplastics of which 21.3% would be tire wear particles. So the average oyster meal in South Carolina would have six times higher the number of microplastics than a typical meal. Um, this is just a summary of um, what our findings have been. And I do want to thank our funding sources, which have been the NIEHS, we're part of the Center for Oceans and Human Health and Climate Change Interactions through the University of South Carolina. We've gotten funding from the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium, and we've also gotten uh, funding from the NEAR Center for Climate Studies. Back to JP. Yeah, excellent, John. That really was great, um, impressive diversity of work. Uh, I was really, as, you, as I think um, you provided a nice example of how the plastics sort of research field is sort of evolving in many directions. And it, like, as you talked about the tire particles, we have these specific questions related to certain particles as well as system-wide, as well as food. So really nice job. Um, did anyone have a quick question for John? We'll also have some time at the end, I think. Okay, well, we'll, we'll um, 
let that, and maybe with um, Bonnie's presentation, uh, there'll be some follow-up. So um, our final presentation of this session is uh, titled Marine Plastic Litter and the Pandemic, Trends in PPE Prevalence and Volunteer Cleanup Efforts. And this will be given by uh, John's graduate student, Bonnie Ertel from the Citadel. Hi, I'm Bonnie, and as you mentioned, I am one of the students in the Weinstein Lab. I'm currently getting my master's degree in biology, and I began this work on PPE prevalence and volunteer cleanup efforts as part of a class research credit, and now it has continued on into a grant-funded research, which is great to, um, to continue this research, but first I want to show you some of the preliminary findings that we have found. So in terms of PPE, I probably don't need to tell you how COVID has drastically increased our production use and unfortunately the disposal or improper disposal of PPE. Finding gloves and masks on surfaces around um, different beaches, marshes and parking lots. And basically you can find PPE anywhere. And one study suggested that using annual global estimates, we, would, we were at risk of losing 1.56 billion masks into our oceans every year. So that contributes a lot to our plastic pollution problem. So we wanted to look at trends in plastic litter, especially including PPE, using existing databases. So basically using citizen science where volunteers are going out and cleaning up litter, looking at that data to track trends in PPE throughout the pandemic. We also hypothesized that the pandemic would affect volunteer efforts at these litter cleanups. So volunteer effort in terms of how many people are going out and how many cleanups are being conducted throughout the pandemic. So we looked at that with two main objectives. First, to look at the volunteer effort in both national, so the whole United States, as well as state cleanup databases. And again, we are here in the state of South Carolina, so a little further south from you guys up there in the Northeast, but this is what we have found in the South Carolina. And we also looked at the litter composition and how much PPE was abundant in these cleanups. So to do that, like I said, we looked at volunteer litter cleanup databases. These are open source tracking citizen science, and they're maintained one by the Ocean Conservancy, and they have international data, but we focused on United States, and the South Carolina Aquarium maintains a local database for South Carolina. So this is the Ocean Conservancy. If you go on their website, they're TIDES, which stands for Trash Information and Data for Education and Solutions. Their website tracks international volunteer databases, and they do have an international coastal cleanup every year in the September, it's typically the second or third weekend, where they host major cleanups for large organizations and large volunteer networks to come out and conduct cleanups. So on this map here is the number of cleanups. Um, I think this is like all time data, but we just focused, as I've said, on the United States. So in terms of the number of volunteers participating in these cleanups over the last five years, here from 2016 to 2020, we see that over the years, more volunteers were participating in the cleanups, but as you would kind of expect, there was a major drop in 2020. And if we look at this by a month by month basis, because I mentioned in September, there's a lot of cleanups. Um, so this is 2016, um, September, there was more cleanups than you could, even could be shown on this graph here. So that's what that arrow kind of indicates an outlier of 141,000 volunteers that showed up in the month of September of 2016. So I'm gonna show you the same graph for 2016, 2017, more volunteers, 2018, 2019, and then in 2020, there was way less volunteers. And again, this is likely due to the pandemic, people not wanting to go out, especially not in large groups. So, and that's what these cleanups typically were, especially the ones in September. So this is a sum of the last few graphs I showed you, breaking it down again, month by month over the different years. And you can see 2020, way less volunteers showing up for these cleanups. But interestingly, if you look at the total number of cleanups, which is what I show you here, there actually tended to be more total cleanups in 2020 for most of the months, even in September. So there was more cleanups, but less volunteers, which indicates that smaller groups were people, of people were going out to allow for social, social distancing and local considerations during the pandemic. So there was less volunteers, but more cleanups. 
for the United States. And if we look at the abundance of plastic litter of what these cleanups were collecting, so up here I have the number of cleanups for each of the last five years, and then broke down the total amount of plastic litter into the major types, which are shown down here. And I could go into details in this, but what I really wanna focus on is the red line, which stands for personal hygiene and PPE items, so gloves and masks, were part of this personal hygiene category. And you can see there was a major increase from 12 to 23,000 PPE items. So it's about 19,000 times increase in PPE abundance over just one year as the pandemic hit. But PPE items is a, still a very small percent. So 0.671 is a percent of 2020 total plastic litter. So yes, we're finding a lot of PPE, but it's still a small portion of the problem. I do wanna dive into the composition of plastic litter. So what types are being found before the pandemic? These were the averages for each of those groups that were shown on the last slide. So this is before the pandemic. Again, personal hygiene is a very small percentage. During the pandemic, some increased, some decreased. Um, interesting, I, main one I wanna point out is personal hygiene, but also food and bev increased. So that's a lot of more, a lot more of single use plastics considered for sanitation during the pandemic. But personal hygiene increased and that is likely driven by PPE. So here in 2019, before the pandemic, only 12 masks and gloves were found and PPE was a very small percentage of the personal hygiene category. Here's some of the other categories just or items, just for an example. So this was 2019 and in 2020, gloves and masks majorly increased um, and the other categories were kind of shifted accordingly. And interestingly, some updated data in 2020. So this is just January through June of this year. Um, we have already found more masks in these six months than we did in all of 2020, or all that were reported by volunteers. And that led to a major increase in the percent that PPE makes up of personal hygiene. And it is now the most prevalent item being found for this category. In terms of abundance, this shows since the beginning of the pandemic, January 2020, and runs through June of this year. You can see that in the beginning, there wasn't all that much. Things really began here in the United States for us around late February, early March. But we didn't really find many masks until September. But remember, the major um, international cleanup is held in September. So I wanted to kind of consider the total number of cleanups that happened that month. And you can see that this spike in September really was likely driven by the extreme number of cleanups that were happening that time. But cleanups have continued to find PPE in high abundance. This is 5,000 um, per month since then in the United States. This is a map of 2020 where that debris was actually found. So you can see some is on the coast, some is inland. We have some rural urban areas. Um, it's, it's distributed, but this is the volunteer um, this is where they're finding them. And we wanted to focus on South Carolina, but you see there's not much data reported for here. So we had to find another database. I looked at the South Carolina Aquariums Litter-Free Digital Journal, and this is an open source citizen science initiative. Unfortunately, they didn't have like a category for PPE. So for my research credit, I got to go through all the comments and identify gloves and masks and put numbers to the comments. And they didn't have any number of them, the total number of volunteers going out. But if we look at the number of cleanups reported for South Carolina throughout the last four, five years from 2016 to 2020, there wasn't as clear of a trend. Remember in the United States, there was a lot more cleanups um, with smaller volunteers. Here, it's not as clear of a trend. If we look at the total amount of plastic has certainly increased since 2016. And in 2020, we found, or volunteers found 20 PPE items in 2019 and about 788 in 2020. And this is what was reported in comments. So the actual number could be higher than this. Um, nonetheless, there was a 40 times increase, but that still only accounts for less than 1% or 0.213% of the total plastic litter. And so here I kind of skipped the breakdown of types. It's a similar story for South Carolina, but here this graph shows again, the abundance of PPE items and the black dots are the total number of cleanups happening that month. You see that over 
the pandemic as the pandemic has persisted, PPE has continued to be found in high abundances. And if you consider, if we wanted to look at the number of cleanups that were reporting PPE, so the number of times people went out, how often were they actually finding this type of litter in both the United States and in South Carolina? Throughout most of this year, it's been around 50%. So that's half the time that volunteers are going out to conduct a cleanup, they're refining and reporting PPE items. So in summary, I have the, U the US data from the Ocean Conservancy on the left and South Carolina data on the right. Um, in general, there was less volunteers, but more cleanups compared to previous years, indicating smaller social distanced cleanups. And in terms of litter composition, there was an increase in PPE items reported during the pandemic, as we would expect, but that PPE litter still remains a small portion of our larger plastic pollution problem, less than 1%. In the US, it's 0.671, and in South Carolina, it's 0.213. So, but none nonetheless, PPE has become a prevalent type of litter and it found in high abundance in volunteer cleanups. So in conclusion, we were able to show that volunteer cleanups using citizen science has shown that PPE pollution has increased at both a national and a state level. And we all probably know this by just going outside and unfortunately taking a walk, you'll probably find some. And it's likely that as the pandemic persists, monitoring how these PPE items are being improperly disposed of could inform future management policy. And I do wanna say that I'm not saying that mask usage is bad. I think that the improper disposal of these items is what we should consider more about the ultimate environmental impact that this pandemic could have on our environment. And with that, here's some of my references. Um, I would like to thank you for listening and take any questions if we have time. Excellent, great job, Bonnie. Why don't we open the floor? Any questions for Bonnie? None right now. Um, well, let I want to kind of take a pause, and I know I've made comments. I, I guess I first want to comment on on Bonnie's how how I think it really highlights. I think what we heard both in John's talk and and in Bonnie's, uh, you know, obviously people are a big problem. Um, we he, we highlighted the litter issue, and and I think PPE is just another example of sort of a, a, a nice point source, so to speak, or a temporal source of of of, um, of pollution that we're seeing more and more of, and and so I think your work is really highlighting that reality. Unfortunately, um, any uh, we did have one nice overarching question that maybe we'll pose to you all in the chat from. Uh, sorry, uh, from Brett, uh, he put in the chat, the plastics problem seems nearly intractable without major changes in policy and plastic waste management. What would an effective comprehensive strategy for plastic pollution management and cleanup look like? That is a broad, anyone wanna try that? Colleen. I can make a start on this, yeah. This is it is a challenge and there are so many facets to consider uh, in this. Um, so I, I think some ideas that I think are worth sharing is that, um, you know, that there is talk that uh, some arguments sway towards reducing the production of plastics may be necessary to reduce its pathway um, through the entire chain. And we know that industry is innovating. Uh, but also there is encouragement to from industry to use recycling as a as a as a tool, um, but that puts an enormous strain on infrastructure facilities and funding um, needed from region states you know federal support perhaps, um, and I know there's some interesting um, like I, what's the word there's some interesting interventions going on from industry um, towards policy to try and block some reductions of plastics in some areas. And I, this is not my area of expertise. I would say this is something that um, our, um, our uh, expert on uh, policy and law, uh, Beth Mendenhall, who is based in URI, she's got a policy paper on this, which I can put into the chat. Uh, but this is something that she does explore in more detail. But it, you know, these are just some challenges that we do face. So that's just to get the conversation started. 
Excellent. Any, um, maybe, maybe I'll call on J John Weinstein, if you wouldn't mind commenting. You, I think I won't calling on you because you highlight kind of two different sources and those of course require different management solutions. Any, any thought on that? Well, the reason we're studying pathways is because it allows for an opportunity for um, mitigation and capturing those particles before they enter our coastal waterways. Um, with tire wear particles, and I could speak all day about tire wear particles, but um, the, um, the density, right, it, is, it always comes back down to density and, and fate is that um, because they tend to be denser than most of the uh, microplastics, they could be captured in stormwater infrastructure. It's just a matter of designing the stormwater infrastructure specifically to capture that and to you know, make it a way, make those structures in such a way it's easy to clean out, not something that has to be done on a daily or weekly basis, but maybe once a year. Uh, and we're working with the town of Mount Pleasant right across the harbor on, on different um, types of uh, ways to help capture some of those particles. Oh, one of the things that I've heard before, and I, this is beyond my area of expertise, probably a chemical engineer could weigh in on this, but we probably have too many types of plastic polymers out there to effectively be recycling them. If we could narrow this down to perhaps two different types of polymers, and that would help in the efficiency of how much is being recycled and you know, get to the point like with aluminum cans where most of that gets recycled. Um, and with chemical engineering right now, I think a lot of the functional properties and, and the reason we've gone to all these different polymers is for their functional properties. But I think chemical engineering could be moving in a way such that with a couple of polymers, you could get all that functionality. And so all the different single use plastics could be made out of just a couple of polymers. Those are my two cents. John, I have a question for you about the tires. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, from your experience, of, I, I love the work that you presented. It's really interesting and, and how frustrating having to come across these particles and uh, then discarding themselves uh, for the identification. Um, do, do you see, like, various versions of this in tires? And also, do you know if there's, like, any innovations in the tire manufacturing industry where they're trying to um, alter this or change the composition of these tires? Well, um, so I'm not that familiar with the manufacturing of tires, and I'm, I'm not familiar with innovation on, on tires at all. But I can tell you the tires are a composite material of natural rubber and synthetic rubber and fillers and carbon black and preservatives and zinc and hydrocarbons. And so no two manufacturers are making the same type of, of tire with the same composition. And that's why you get these particles and it's a composite of different materials. So it's very hard to analytically to confirm the identification of the particles. You have to use sort of that weight of, a weight of evidence approach that we took on this. And then there's, you know, there are black particles from the tires, but there is also the bitumen from the asphalt. And so these, these are other particles that maybe we should be considering as they um, make their way to our coastal waterways. Sure. And, and you mentioned about trying to come up with method or like some um, infrastructure that can try and capture these particles. I'm interested with the with these case studies you've done with the bridges, what would something like look, look like for that? Um, they make these, um, uh, there are these box, like cement boxes, and I forget the technical name off the top of my head, but as the um, water comes off the street surface, they go through these boxes before they enter the stormwater detention ponds. And so these boxes would slow down the flow and help capture heavier sediments like, um, well, heavier particulate matter like sediments and some of the heavier tire wear particles. One of the things that we found and Bonnie's leading this study as well, is that if you look in the literature at the density of tire wear particles, the industry will often give you one number, which is very similar to sediments. And so one would think that most of the tire wear particles are settling out wherever they enter the water and they're not moving around. 
well, we find Tywar particles floating on the surface and um, maybe Bonnie can weigh in, but what we're finding is a very wide range of densities because they're made up of this composite material. So no two particles have exactly the same density. And so they are much more mobile in the environment than, you know, if you look at the literature, it might lead you to believe. Yeah, I just wanted to add a few things about that. They are, there is definitely a range of densities and even the characteristics. So they have a typical morphology of being cylindrical, but they can come in different, different shapes, especially if they're coming from like turf infill is made of crumb rubber, which is just cut up pieces. So they're a lot more square and could potentially have different densities or different um, fates in the environment. I have seen a German group working on a capture device that would go behind tires so that as the tire is going up, this little piece, um, some sort of filter, I don't know much about how it works. It's just something I've seen in passing, but this device would capture any particles coming off the tire, like right there at the source. Um, I think that in terms of preventing plastic pollution, getting back to the source is as important as anything. Yeah, okay, interesting, thank you. And JP, I was wondering, do you mind if I ask another question? I'm no, sorry to- No, go for it. I think the session. Yeah. Feel free to speak over me, I can talk forever. Uh, it's, just, it's just really interesting to, you know, to be among some like really interesting experts and I've loved all the talks, they've been great, um, really informative. Um, so I guess like the question I have is, you know, we've got some good representations of different regions here and I'm wondering like, you know, how are each of our regions motivated to like intervene with um, handling waste, you know, in, 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 as in any sort, whether it's tires or whether it's recycling, for example, um, in your different regions, because, you know, it is a financial pressure on those systems. And I'm wondering, are your regions like motivated to do that? Or is that needing like public pressure to drive that forward? Or maybe other types of pressure? Um, maybe I'll chime in just and say, I mean, I think from the waste management standpoint in the United States, it does vary by state and really by local, mm -hmm. local management entity, but I feel like we do as probably as good of a job as we, as we can globally. I mean, you look at sort of mismanaged plastics, you know, our, our ratio is very low, but we do produce a lot and use a lot of plastic, um, I think the biggest issue on that management side is is internationally, of course, and and there's just such higher plastic mismanagement, well, just waste man mismanagement in general. Um, so contributing to that problem, I think, is or helping find solutions to internationally is really important. But anyone else want to chime in on that? I'll, I'll chime in for us, and we are we're sort of like Rhode Island. We're kind of a small, narrow state, and um, we have sort of very, you know, heavily urbanized area up north, and then a very um, sort of tourism-based economy in the south. And so, where I'm based in the south of the state, um, we have we have sort of a very itinerant population. And so, I think the state um, management, waste management, struggles with trying to implement. Uh, policy and re even recycling efforts that everyone knows and understands and follows because we just have so many people kind of moving in and out and so that there's always that issue in a tourism-based economy but they try any others on management um let me to, that's a great question I, I think i think what we learn what we're learning is just how these problems are, are because the sources are varied. And so the, while it's waste management on one side, you, you look at the, the tires, going back to the tires, it's just such a good one. There is a product that is designed to wear down and, and be released into the environment. Um, we don't really, I don't know how well that industry thought of the ramifications, but what ha what's happened with coho salmon has really um, raised awareness of the potential impact and, uh, I'm sure there'll be other cases uh, and hopefully we can find solutions for specific problems. Um, I wanted to pivot Jason, is Jason still there? And maybe get his take on, you've heard a lot of science. Are you, are you around? <laughs> the, uh, he, he's there, he's mobile. Yeah, yeah mobile, mobile on today. The on the communication side, do you think as scientists, what do we need to do better in communicating this? It's a very diverse, 
complex problems. It, it is. And I think the trying to figure out, um, again, I think it's, you know, like the policy discussion that we were just having really, you know, that, that means trying to figure out policymakers and, um, and local municipalities, local waste management uh, operations, as far as an audience goes. And so uh, from my perspective, I'm always trying to, you know, figure out the best tool for the job. So, you know, uh, kind of a, a cinematic emotional uh, film, for example, isn't likely to have a lot of impact uh, for policymakers who need to come up with kind of real world working solutions. So that's the wrong, it's the wrong, um, I'm not a golfer, but it's the wrong golf club, if you will. Uh, so I think from, from my perspective as a communicator, and it's been really fascinating to hear the, both the breadth and the depth of the work talked about today, uh, trying, to, trying to kind of translate those results and those ideas and the hypotheses that come out of the work that's already being created, figuring out how to take those hypotheses and build communication strategies so that when the results are learned, not to be prescriptive about the results, but when those results are learned, we can turn those into action plans because I think that's the, the real challenge with this issue is trying to figure out as, as we learn information, new information, how do we actually enact it, right? How do we, how do we influence local communities uh, via bag bans? How do we influence local companies uh, to do better? How do we influence policymakers to, to really consider regulating this um, and perhaps a more heavy handed way? So yeah, I think that there's a lot there. Yeah, there is a lot there. That's that's uh, well well said, and I think um, you know you give us a lot of things to think about as we try and tackle this gigantic problem that I think someone in the chat kind of highlighted. I guess it was getting back to Brett's question. Um, maybe on the final point, we'll end with our first speaker, which I wanted to ask Peter. I think um, you know what's the role that universities should play. I'm not sure if Peter's still on. He's he's there. Um, I. I I, I really commend URI's efforts, but I think universities as a whole can do a better job of both doing science and making a difference in the world. Can you add to that? Yeah, um, look, as a scientist, I'm not of the mind that all of our science must be applied. Uh, universities need to support uh, inquiry and advancing knowledge across every discipline. Um, and, and there may not always be a path to direct application, but in this case, there pretty damn well better be given what we are facing. And the university has an interesting role to play in society. There's really no other organization that has such a wide range of academic specialties under one roof with the potential to break down silos across them and, and really merge disciplines that otherwise in, in, in the non-university real world wouldn't necessarily interact and intersect. Um, you know, the challenge, of course, is that as humans, we live in silos, we prefer silos, we are comfortable in our own silos. And, and so it's always a push to break them down and move across barriers, um, even, even in the same building on the same floor. Um, but that's really what we need to be doing at a university. And, and that's, a, you know, we're a microcosm for the diversity of knowledge and expertise uh, in, in society. And our mission is twofold, really, to educate and to advance knowledge and translate that to bettering our world. Um, most organizations don't have that as its central mission, but we do. So universities can serve as conveners. We can serve to motivate. We have the ear of our legislators. We have um, a reasonably good reputation with the public. Uh, of course, that varies uh, from time to time. This is not a banner period of time for scientists with certain segments of our populace, but nonetheless, we do have a lot of influence. And for a problem like this, um, there's no better time uh, for universities to pick the toughest questions that we have, the toughest problems, such as this one, but of course this is only one of many, and, and, and go deep um, and, and form the 
you know, the other thing that universities do well is we work all over the world. We have researchers all over. We, we're making connections all the time. Um, again, not all organizations do that. We do. So, so, you know, to harness all these resources towards a focused end and improve public policy, education, and developing and develop new technologies that may assist, that's all what should be in our wheelhouse. So, so that's, that's my thought. Well, that's, that's a perfect way to end. Uh, so I, I really want to thank our speakers. Uh, that was really a great session. I really enjoyed it. And uh, a lot of cool, innovative science. Um, John Cohen, it was really nice to meet you and hear about the interdisciplinary work that you're doing. And John Weinstein and Bonnie, I really appreciate you joining us. And, and I know another, uh, the, the URI crowd uh, appreciate the input and the progress. Um, Thanks for the leadership across the board and thanks to Inbree for, for hosting us for this session and have a, a great day, everybody. Enjoy summer.